Welcome back to BioClass Bytes. In this video, we are going to talk about the principles of the ecosystem. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. This lesson is part of Grade 11 Earth and Life Science, Unit 6, Interaction and Interdependence. So these are the lessons in this video. We will be looking into the principles of the ecosystem and terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Before we continue, I recommend that you visit this website from Global Change um, to talk more that talks more about the concept of the ecosystem. I'll provide the link in the description below. So we define an ecosystem as um, made up of biological community together with its physical and uh, chemical environment. Okay. So an ecosystem is made up of the living components, biological community and its non-living components, the physical and chemical factors. We also define an, an ecosystem as a geographic area wherein plants, animals, and other organisms, as, uh, so those are the living uh, factors, together with weather, landscape, and other non-living uh, features, work together to form a bubble of life. You can find a lot of online resources about ecosystem, but one of my recommendations will be uh, this uh, article from National Geographic that talks about um, ecosystem. So um, you can find a lot of related images and text and information, and I'll provide the link in the description below. So if you still remember our lesson on levels of organization, ecosystem is one of the larger um, levels of organization. So um, it's actually made up of community, so those are um, groups of org several groups of organisms from different species, okay, so community, interacting with their physical environment. So that includes the living things and then their non-living things, uh, non-living thing or non-living factors um, in their area. So that's the level of ecosystem. So um, it, actually, if you put all the ecosystems in the world, take it in, into factor it in, then you form the biosphere or that region of the earth that's capable of sustaining life. So here, another uh, description of ecosystem as a level of organization. So a community together with the non-living um, environment forms an ecosystem. This one also, so we, another definition um, of ecosystem as a higher level of organization, several communities living together in a particular region along with the physical environment. So living things, communities with physical environment. So this includes uh, biotic and abiotic components. And examples of that will be a pond, forest, desert, just desert, single S, and grassland. So this one um, is from Britannica.com. I also recommend that you visit this and watch this video. Examine the trophic levels of producers, herbivores, and carnivores in a given ecosystem. So you'll, you will have a lot of um, fun information from this video. I'll provide the link in the description below. This one um, also um, from the virtual school, what is an ecosystem? Uh, very fun, very interesting video. I'll provide the link in the description below. So the word ecosystem is actually a contraction of these two words, ecological system. So ecological system or ecosystem. So we will, um, so in ecosystem, we try to understand how the entire system uh, operates um, as a whole. Okay. So we will be focusing on the functional aspects of the system. How does the ecosystem function? So this includes amount of energy that is produced in photosynthesis. Uh, and we've talked about this uh, in detail in bioenergetics, how energy or materials flow and what rate, uh, what controls the rate of decomposition and how nutrients are cycled in an ecosystem. Uh, in this video, we are going to focus uh, on the following uh, subtopics, the components and processes of an ecosystem, transformation of energy in an ecosystem, element cycling, and control function of an ecosystem, and geography of an ecosystem. Ecosystems consist of living organisms existing in a symbiotic relationship with their environment. Okay, So when we say symbiotic, that's an interconnected relationship. 
that's usually um, mutually beneficial to, do, to both parties. So life forms in ecosystems compete with one another to become the most successful at reproducing and surviving in a given niche or in their given ecological role or position in their environment. So the two main components that exist in an ecosystem are its bi abiotic and biotic factors or components. Okay, so um, abiotic components, these are the, the environment, the physical properties of the environment, the non-living component, while the biotic components are the life forms or the living organisms that occupy that ecosystem. So, again, we define ecosystem as a unit consisting of plants, animals, and microscopic organisms. Okay, so that's your biotic factors in an area functioning together with the physical, non-living physical aspects. So, those are your abiotic factors in an environment. So, ecosystem, biotic, and abiotic factors. So, these are examples or class further classifications of the different factors or components. So for your abiotic factors, that include the climatic factors, and that are, those are temperature, and anything that, that's involved with climate. Uh, so temperature, uh, humidity, atmospheric pressure, wind, and rainfall, while edaphic factors, so those are the soil or the, or the, or the ground features, so that's soil structure, soil pH, minerals, and even the topography um, of the ecosystem. Biotic factors are further divided into the, their ecological niche or the role they play. So you have your producers, uh, which are also your autotrophs. So these are your photosynthetic plants and algae and phytoplankton. Consumers are your heterotrophs. Okay, So those are your herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, and detritivores. Uh, and then there are decomposers or your saprotrophs. So those, those are your fungi, decomposing bacteria, and water molds. Note that the word trough here means to feed. So your autotrophs, autoself, can feed themselves through photosynthesis. Hetero means others, so they need to feed on others. And then saprotrophs, they feed on decaying um, matter. The next principle um, of an ecosystem are the processes of an ecosystem. So um, we all know that uh, energy enters the biological system in the form of light energy. So that's coming from the sun. And through photosynthesis, the, uh, that light energy is transformed into chemical energy okay, in organic molecules, um, so such as photosynthesis, and then harvested um, to, to become adenosine triphosphate or ATP in the process of cellular respiration and in this process ultimately converted to heat energy as a byproduct. So once this heat energy is released, uh, it is lost to the system um, and cannot be recycled um, anymore. Okay? So without the continued input of solar energy, continued um, uh, light energy coming from the sun, biological systems would click, quickly shut down. So because of this, in respect to energy, the earth or an ecosystem is actually considered an open system. Okay? We've all established this in um, bioenergetics. So again, to emphasize, ecosystems have energy flows. Okay? So that flow of energy is usually seen in food chain and food web, wherein the solar energy coming from the sun um, is captured by plants and converted to chemical energy through photosynthesis. So they are consumed by your herbivores and carnivores, so the energy is transferred to them and then through cellular respiration, um, are transformed into chemical energy in the form of ATP. And then when all these organisms die, eventually the decomposers will break down their um, um, uh, physical bodies and then con and re convert and, and recycle those materials into abiotic chemicals that can be used again in uh, the ecosystem. Okay, so all of these processes um, also give off heat um, as byproduct. So in terms of energy, the earth is an open system. However, in terms of matter, the earth is considered a closed system. Therefore, the earth must recycle all those materials. So this is where 
this part comes in. So decomposers must recycle all these materials to be used by the next group of organisms. Living organisms are capable of cycling and recycling materials in an ecosystem. So elements such as carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus enter living things, uh, for example, plants. Uh, once plants ob obtain these materials from their environment, so from the atmosphere, from the soil, that through their roots, while animals obtain these elements um, whenever, whenever they consume other organisms. The third principle is transformation of energy. So the transformation of energy in an ecosystem always begin, mostly begin with the sun. So um, plants were able to capture the energy from the sun, solar energy, and, and convert it into chemical energy through the process of photosynthesis. So carbon dioxide is combined with hydrogen and then with the presence of the pigment chlorophyll. So um, plants are, are capable of producing carbohydrates or those um, glucose molecules. Um, then energy is stored in the high energy bonds of ATP or adenosine triphosphates, uh, which, are, which is then harvested through cellular respiration, um, which are then used by the cells to perform their life processes. So I hope you still remember our lesson on bioenergetics. So this is the uh, chemical equation of... Uh, photosynthesis, so solar energy plus six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water are all needed to create one glucose molecule and give off six oxygen molecules as byproduct. Then if you still remember cellular respiration, so this is the different stages of this process by which one glucose molecule is broken down just to harvest uh, this important molecule ATP or adenosine triphosphate, giving off carbon dioxide and oxygen as byproducts. So if, if you want to refresh your memory about um, photosynthesis and cellular respiration, kindly watch this video uh, of comparing these two processes. I'll provide the link in the description below. And also to help you remember, know that um, these are the following ecological rules or niche of of organisms in an ecosystem. So um, um, plants are mostly considered producers because they are the ones who bring in the solar energy into the ecosystem. Um, uh, so organisms that use plants as a source of food are known as herbivore. Organisms that eat or prey on herbivores are called carnivores. Then omnivores are, an, are animals that eat plant, both plants and meat. Okay, and uh, again, to re refresh you about food chain and food web in which all energy transfer um, are seen and visualized, um, I'll recommend, I recommend that you watch this video. I'll provide the link in the description below. Also, this one is Food Chain's compilation, Crash Course Kids. Um, quite a longer video um, talking about food chains and food web. Again, I'll provide the link in the description below. So this is how photosynthesis and cellular respiration um, are inter interrelated and interconnected in transformation of energy in an ecosystem. So producers or autotrophs use um, sol uh, capture solar energy um, and also use the following materials, um, water and carbon dioxide, which are then byproducts, um, which are then uh, is a byproduct of cellular respiration exhaled by um, animals okay, to perform their light-dependent light and light-independent reactions, all to produce that glucose molecule. Uh, they also produce um, oxygen as a byproduct. Um, how in cellular respiration, that byproduct by plants is actually one of the main um, um, materials needed for cellular respiration. So that glucose molecule will undergo glycolysis and then Krebs cycle and then electron transport chain all just to harvest that ATP molecule um, that will be used by the cells to, to perform their life processes. So cellular respiration also again give off carbon dioxide as a byproduct and water as a byproduct. So we've mentioned uh, this principle in one of the first slide, first few slides. 
Um, and the fourth principle is element cycling of an ecosystem. So this tells us where and how fast elements move in a system, so in this case in an ecosystem, while residence time indicates how long on average a particular element remains in a system before it leaves. So we've already established that in terms of energy, the earth, therefore all ecosystems, are considered open systems in terms of energy, while the earth in terms of material or, or matter is considered a closed system. So we've, we've discussed this thoroughly in bioenergetics, that um, the earth, the entire biosphere, all the ecosystems are constantly receiving energy from the sun. So with respect to energy, we are an open system. And then that ener solar energy is captured by plants through photosynthesis, um, consumed by um, animals through, um, um, uh, through eating and then through cellular respiration, and then um, they eventually die, okay? And, and that is actually one, one, uh, one linear process as seen in food chain and webbed processes in food web. However, in terms of uh, matter, the earth is considered, the biosphere and all the, all the ecosystems are considered a closed system because um, in our planet, uh, nothing disappears and everything disperses, okay? So we've talked about this in, in the first few units for this academic year. Okay, so uh, slow, ge slow ge geological cycles are also involved in, in some of this cycling of nutrients, okay? such as sedimentation and mineralization, um, while other um, ge geological cycles such as volcanic eruptions and weathering also contribute into adding materials in uh, an ecosystem. The fifth um, principle is control function of an ecosystem. So we have two dominant theories on the control of ecosystem. The first one is bottom-up control. It's, it states that it's, it's the producers who controls how that, that ecosystem function. So how does that happen? If the nutrient supply increases, this results in the increase in the production of autotrophs or the producers, which are then propagated or... or, or, or um, uh, uh, transferred throughout the rest of the food web and all of the other trophic levels will also respond to that increase of food availability. So because of that, energy and materials will cycle faster. So to visualize that, okay, so, so let's have this um, example. So in bottom, so you can see here the producer, the host plant, then the first level consumer, grasshopper, the herbivore, and then the spider as the predator. So in bottom-up control, what, is, what it says is that if there is an increase in plant, and I hope you still remember the um, energy pyramid, wherein we have more producers, uh, then we have here a lesser um, herbivores, and then the rest of the consumers, and then the apex predator are the fewest in, in terms of number. So in bottom-up control, an increase in plant uh, quality and quantity benefits the herbivores. So, so since they have a lot to eat, they will be able to survive longer and then they will be able to reproduce. Then their numbers will increase. And because of that, since the herbivores, the primary consumers are increasing, then eventually the top predators or one of its predators, such as the spider, will also increase in um, number. So if there's an increase in the producer's level or this producer's, producer's trophic level, then we can also see an increase in um, the rest of the trophic levels. The next type of control is top-down control. So this states that predation, so these are the predators, and grazing by higher trophic levels controls ultimately controls the ecosystem function. So the control of the population numbers cascades from the top of the energy pyramid down to or even top of the food chain or top of the food web down to the bottom trophic levels so how do we visualize that so if you have an increase in predators that increase will result in fewer grazers so those are the herbivores and the decrease in the grazers will result in turn for primary producers um will, will have uh, will in turn cause to have more primary primary producers because uh, fewer of them are being eaten. So this one uh, goes this way. So if there's an increase in the predator, 
predation of the herbivores increase plant density because if there's an increase in predator, so this is their, their food, the, the grasshopper, so that if there's an increase in, in spiders, uh, more, of, more of them will be eating grasshoppers, so grasshoppers will decrease in number. So since very few grasshoppers are eating now, the, the producers, the host plants, this will cause the plants to increase in number. So um, increase, decrease, increase. While in bottom-up, if there's an increase in plant production, there's an increase in uh, herbivores or first level consumers, then there's also the increase in um, top predators. So those are the two ways by which um, control, uh, control function happens in an ecosystem. The next subtopic um, is ecological relationships. So in an ecosystem, species can have many different types of interactions with each other. By the way, this is always pronounced um, and written in plural form, species. Or even if you're just talking to one species, it must always have a letter S at the end. Okay? So this refers to a group of organisms so closely related with each other that they can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So, um, some of these interactions can help both of the species, some can help just one of the species, and some can be negative for one or both of the species. All of these interactions are needed to maintain balance in an ecosystem. And we call this a symbiotic relationship or symbiotic, symbiosis, wherein two species have a close relationship with each other. So, symbiosis means to live together. So, an ecological community is defined as a group of actually or potentially interacting species living in the same place. And a community is, or, or a group of uh, several populations of different species is bound together by a network of influences that species have on one another. So, these are examples of those ecological relationships. Uh, and let's look at the um, signs in order for us to remember and then the effects of those relationships to both species. So we have mutualism. So to remember that positive, positive, it means that both species benefit from the interaction. A commensalism, positive zero, one species benefits, the other one is unaffected. Competition, negative, negative, each species are affected negatively. We'll see more about that later. And then parasitism, um, predation and herbivory, positive, negative, one species benefits, the other one is disadvantaged. So to learn more about uh, parasitism, commensalism, and mutualism, I recommend that you watch this video from Amoeba Sisters, Ecological Relationships. I'll provide the link in the description below. I also recommend that you visit this um, article from National Geographic, Ecological Relationships. They have a lot of information and examples and photos. Um, again, I'll provide the link in the description below. So, mutualism describes ecological interaction between two or more species in which, in which both of them or all of them benefits from the interaction. So, this is thought to be the most common type of ecological interaction and it is often dominant in most communities um, around the globe. So, let's look at some of these examples. So we have here a red-billed oxpecker, okay, so that's the bird here, which eats the ticks on the impalas or, or, or this um, organism, okay, the horned organism. It eats ticks on the impalas coat in a cleaning symbiosis. Then dogs and sheep are among the first animals to be domesticated. So both dogs and sheep have mutualistic relationship with humans. So we take care of goats as pets. So in, in turn, we get protection from other harmful creatures. Okay, they protect us. While sheep, they have food and shelter so uh, that they get from humans who, uh, who take care of them. Um, in return, they provide their um, um, wool. They, they provide their, their um, uh, wool for humans to, to harvest. Then hummingbird, hawk, moth, drinking nectar um, from this plant, dianthus, 
Um, so they get the nectar from the plant, but the plant on, on the other side um, uh, get, um, uh, speeds up pollination because the, the hummingbird is one of its many pollinators. So they, they help each other. They, the, the plant provides the nectar for the bird, then the hummingbird um, allows pollination or lets pollination happen among the different plants. Then this clownfish and uh, sea anemone, they have a mutualistic uh, symbiotic relationship. So here the fish, um, uh, the fish stays here in the anemone and have eventually adapted to, to, to be resistant to the stinging stinging um, abilities of the sea anemone um, so it drives off butterfly fish uh, which is possibly one of the uh, consumers of the sea anemone well the sea anemone tentacles protects the fish from predators so those are just one of the many examples of mutualism so commensalism so this is a type of relationship between two organisms in which one benefits and the other one does not so this includes the commensal the species that benefits, while the host is the unaffected organism. So we see here, three frogs use the plants as protection. So the plants um, uh, is the host, so they are not affected, while the frogs um, are the commensal species. So cattle egrets, they, they eat the insects uh, stirred up by the cattle when, when they are grazing. So that makes them uh, the commensal, while the cattle or the or the cow are not um, the cows are not affected golden jackals so that would be this um, dog like uh, similar to dogs or, or related to dogs uh, organism um, once they have been expelled from a, a, a pack will trail a tiger to feed on the remains of its kill so the commensal there will be the the jackal the golden jackal and then, because it, he's, it is the one that benefits from the remains of the kills of the tiger, and then the tri tiger is the host because it's not affected um, whatsoever. Next will be competition. So this is an interaction between organisms or species, uh, which both of the species are, are harmed in the process. So this is because of limited supply of one resource, such as food and water, or sometimes even meats. Okay, are females in the species, and they are used both. Uh, and use can use by both by by both species can also be a factor for their competition. So examples of that would be a male lion and spotted hyena. So both of them have the same ecological niche. So they have the same ecological roles in the ecosystem. So they are in competition with each other. Um, so sea anemones compete for the food. So one sea anemone competes with other sea anemone for um, for food for the territory in their in their location. Um, then we have here um, hearty beast. Um, so those are two male hearty beasts, locking horns, fiercely defending their their territories and some sometimes the females of their territories. So they would fight and then whoever wins will get to keep the territory. So that's one example of competition. And then we have here flabing, flamingos. Okay, so they are competing for territories, mates, or food. So they are fighting with each other for those limited resources. Then predation is an interaction wherein one organism, the predator, kills and eats the other, its prey. So predator is the one that hunts, prey is the one being hunted. So predators are adapted for highly specialized hunting. Uh, so that allows them to be to be very to have very acute senses, vision, speed, hearing, or overall power. So we have here one, our favorite bird, the peregrine falcon, eating its prey, uh, a smaller bird, possibly a pigeon. A pigeon. Um, so here, so the predator, fa uh, peregrine falcon, and then the prey. So we also have microscopic uh, predation. So the paramecium. Um, is feeding off on, on the bacteria in this uh, microscopic view okay, around it. Then we also have social predators, okay, so such as wolves. So they hunt, they hunt by pack. Um, to they they cooperate with each other to hunt and kill uh, bison, which is the, one of their many prey. So you can actually search online for more examples. Very interesting predation. 
Parasitism is a relationship between species where one of the organism lives off on the other. So that's the parasite. And the host is the one that, that um, is, is caused harm, right? Causing it some harm. And parasites are adapted structurally, structurally to this way of life. So parasites are typically smaller than their host. And a true parasite do not, does not kill its host because why would you kill the one that provides you food? So it does not kill. They just make them sick, but they do not kill them. So for example, here the protozoan, trypanosoma, okay, it's the parasite that feeds on the red blood cells. Okay? Or even the, even the, in, the, in the entire human body. So leaf spot on oak tree. So here the spread of the parasitic fungus. So that's the fu parasite. Um, it, they're limited by the defensive properties of the of the tree. Okay, so the tree eventually adapted uh, uh, chemical uh, defensive chemicals to to counter uh, the fung the parasitic fungus. So as you can see, there are some parts that do not have the fungi the fungus. There are some who are who are scattered with fungi. Then human head lice, as you can see here, are direct are, are directly transmitted obligate ectoparasites. So ectoparasite, they are found outside the body, ecto outside. So they are examples of parasites in humans. And then we can see here a microscopic view of the scolex or the head of the tapeworm taenasolium, an intestinal parasite, so internal parasite. As you can see here, they have this hooks and suckers that allows them to attach to the uh, gastrointestinal tract of um, humans, their, their uh, host. So you, you can find a lot more information and examples online. The last principle of ecosystem is the geography of ecosystems. So there are many different ecosystems all over the globe. So we have rainforests, tundra, coral reefs and ponds, grasslands and deserts. So why is there such different varieties? Well, it because well mainly it's because of climate. So the difference, the climate differences from place to place largely influences the type of ecosystems that we can see. And this terrestrial ecosystem are are greatly um, affected by the dominant vegetation or the dominant type of plants that can survive in the climate of the region. So the word biome is used to describe a major vegetation type. Uh, such as uh, I've mentioned tropical rainforest, grassland, tundra, extending over a large geographic area. So it also refers to a vegetation category that is dominant over a large geographical scale and a little bit broader than what we can consider, consider an ecosystem. So if you're interested, I recommend that you visit this lecture PDF from Grade 8 Biology entitled Biomes. Um, you can actually access that in the online library. But lift, uh, lift, uh, lifted from those lecture PDFs are the following slides. So if you're interested, you can actually watch this video, Biomes, the Living Landscapes of Earth. Um, I will provide the link in the description below. And then this one also, Biomes of the World for Children, Oceans, Mountains, Grassland, Rainforest, and Desert from Free School. Again, I'll provide the link in the description below. So biomes, again, are various regions of the earth can, that can be distinguished by their, again, dominant climate, dominant fauna, so those are the animals, and dominant flora, those are the plants, okay? So uh, these, are the, these are the factors that we can actually use to, to describe them and classify them. Habitat, uh, diversity, human activity, and all that. Uh, you can actually visit WWF, the World uh, Wildlife Foundation, um, uh, to learn more about biomes and I'll provide the link in the description below. I also recommend that you visit this from Arizona State University, Ask a Biologist. So they have this section here all about biomes. So that these are the different types of biomes in which they have a lot of description. So rainforest, desert, tundra, taiga, and, and a lot of information and, and videos and um, pictures. So I recommend that you visit this. I'll provide the link in the description below. So this map shows us the major biomes of the world. So let's look at the legend here below. So um, uh, let's start from the top. So from, from, the, from the north, up north. So you have here mostly the ice sheet and polar desert. So for example, you can see it here. Um, 
uh, frozen glaciers or frozen uh, ice sheets uh, on the North Pole. And then below that, you have tundra. Okay? Then below tundra, you have your taiga. So these are the cold parts of the cold regions of the world. So very, very harsh uh, um, biome, very harsh environment. Then below that, uh, you have both your steep, okay? And then some the mixed deciduous forest here in this region. And then uh, you also have along the equator, your tropical rainforest, okay? So you can see here the Philippines is part of this type of biome, tropical rainforest. Then you also have here desert along this region, and then desert here, uh, tropical rainforest here, and then desert here, okay? Then you also have savanna here in the in this continent, okay? African continent here. Uh, and then below that, more steep. And then you also have here Medita Mediterranean vegetation along here. And then you also have in the South Pole, another ice sheet or polar desert. Okay. So this shows us the comparison of the annual average annual temperature and average annual precipitation and what type of biome can survive in those conditions. So for those with um, very, uh, below zero annual temperature, so below zero negative degrees, so very, very cold, then very few below 100 annual precipitation. So you have there your uh, tundra. That's one type of bio. Then, as the temperature increases, okay, so you can, and then that precipitation also increases, you can either have a boreal forest or temperate grassland, okay? And then woodland, shrubland, the temperature is slowly increasing here at this point. And then you have your subtropical desert. But as you can see here, all of this mostly fall, fall below a 100 annual precipitation temperature. So 100 centimeters. So that's the the height of the rain uh, when they estimated the annual precipitation. So what, less than 100 centimeters. So these are the ones who can exist at the following um, precip annual precipitation levels. Um, however, above, the, above 100, up to 200, you can have your temperate forest, but they're also getting a uh, higher temperature. And then as you can see here, uh, you also have a higher temperature. So you have your tropical seasonal forest or savanna. Okay? So they still have very few, very few rain throughout the year. But then, um, as you can see here, um, uh, between the temperature of 10 to, one, to 20 degrees Celsius, so that's still quite cold now. Temperature, so you have your temperate forest, so they have an annual precipitation between 200 to 300 annual temperature. And then the hot, in, in the hot, one of the hottest biomes, but with the most number of precipitation or rain throughout the year. So you have your tropical rainforest. So that's between the temperature of 20 to 30 degrees with 300 to 400 um, centimeters of annual precipitation. So this is quite a hot and humid type of um, biome. So that ends our video. I hope you learned something new today. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. Till next time, goodbye.